All right. It is noon. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining for the third session of Forestry Lunch Breaks. I am Patrick Schultz, uh, Extension Forester with Washington State University in Southwest Washington. If you're just joining for the first time today, uh, we are discussing the benefits of Washington hardwoods and focusing on an individual tree in each session. Today, we are going to be focusing on Oregon oak, uh, which is my all-time favorite hardwood species in Washington. Before we get started, just uh, the usual checkups here. Um, please make sure that if you're typing in the chat box, if you want to submit questions, comments, whatnot, uh, that you have the two setting uh, selected for everyone so that everybody can see that. Otherwise, you're just uh, chatting with me and it's good for everybody to see your questions and comments. Um, and letting you know to, yeah, please feel free to do so throughout the session. We'll, we'll have time for questions at the end. And this will also be recorded and sent out along with the chat box transcripts and, you know, any number of resources that we discussed during the session. Uh, probably early next week, although maybe by the end of the week, if I'm particularly ambitious, we will see. All right, so we will go ahead and get started. All right, as I said, today we are focusing on Oregon oak, and I really love this tree. Uh, well, I really love oaks in general, and this happens to be Washington's only native oak. Uh, but I just think it's a really unique tree and has a lot of, uh, of very cool features. So getting across the basics first, um, Quercus garyana is the scientific name. It is also called Gary Oak, uh, and it was named after Nicholas Gary, who was, I, I think, the some sort of higher up in the Hudson Bay Company. Um, deputy governor, that's what it says in my notes. And whatever taxonomist or botanist was responsible for naming this tree may have wanted a job at the Hudson Bay Company and named it after Nicholas Gary. So it is in the Fagaceae family, which is also the same family as uh, beech trees and chestnuts, uh, other trees that produce large nuts. Um, and although we don't have any native beech or chestnuts in Washington, we just have the one native oak. So in terms of form, um, in terms of height, you know, it can it can get into 40 to 90 feet tall. It's a pretty wide range, as you can see there. And it depends a lot on whether it's open grown, like the one you see in the picture here, or if it's grown more in a, in a dense stand. That's obviously going to force it to put on a little more vertical growth. But it likes to grow like this, widespread and crowned, one of the reasons... I think it's uh, so beautiful as this sort of form, big branches, really easy to climb. Um, but the tallest tree on record is 120 feet tall, which is pretty significant. Um, the diameter generally maturing around 24 to 40 inches, although if it, it is a very long lived species, it continues to grow, it can be very large and the largest is 97 inches, uh, which is about eight feet in diameter. The crown is among the largest we've discussed so far, even larger than big leaf maple, which we talked about yesterday, often spanning 70 feet across, with the largest being 126 feet, which is really quite large. Again, it really likes to spread out, uh, especially if it has the space in like an oak savanna or like a, a landscape setting, kind of what you see here. So it's very long lived as well. It can go grow uh, to be up to 500 years or so. And I couldn't find any record of the oldest living Oregon oak, uh, maybe somewhere, but I, I wasn't able to find that. So very long living, but very slow growing. Uh, and in Western Washington, we're used to trees growing fast, especially the first two that we discussed, red alder and big leaf maple, very fast juvenile growth. These ones uh, are much, much slower. So you have to be patient and put in the time for, for Oregon oak. It's also adapted to wildfire. Um, the only, I think the only hardwood I can think of in Western Washington that's really adapted to, to wildfire, except maybe Madrone a little, I'm not sure, I'm not one. Um, as I said, it's Washington's only native oak species. Uh, and it's very, right now, because its habitat has been reduced to a fraction of what it once was, it's a, a, a very a pr much a protected species. I, uh, well, protected is um maybe not the right word it can be protected in some local municipalities as in uh you might be restricted from cutting it but it's uh it's very much a high priority species for restoration i guess i should say and we will talk about why and and what's being done in that regard 
All right, moving on here. Identification um, leaves four to six inches long, dark green, pale underneath, deeply lobed. You're never supposed to define uh, a word by using the word, right? And you shouldn't def uh, describe a leaf by saying uh, the species, but you know, it's that typical oak leaf, kind of like maples. Everybody can recognize a maple leaf. Everybody can recognize an oak leaf. Uh, and this is your, your typical oak uh, leaf. Although I will say it is in the white oak family and maybe not everyone knows that, that generally when we talk about oaks, we divide them up into red oaks and white oaks. Red oaks have very sharp pointed lobes. They come to a sharp point. White oaks are uh, have rounded edges on the lobes. And so the Oregon oak is a, is a white in the white oak family, um, which is more of just like a colloquial thing than an actual botanical term. So as I said, they are deeply lobed, very thick, hardy leaves. They turn goldish brown in the fall. They're not particularly vibrant, but they don't just turn brown necessarily like uh, red alder does. The leaf and twig arrangement is alternate. The bark of mature trees is this sort of brownish gray and it has these shallow fissures here. And it forms that kind of like checkered pattern. You can see it's like uh, several little squares kind of checkered up and down the, the stem. The flowers form in early spring, or sorry, from late spring to early summer. And they have these long clusters um, that can actually be quite easy to miss, um, eventually forming the typical oak acorn that we know. And in terms of habitat, it'll grow anywhere from California to southern British Columbia. Uh, it doesn't grow very far north in, in BC, though. And it is really most competitive on droughty soils, including those uh, seasonally saturated soils like floodplains that become very droughty in the summer. You know, those heavy clay soils that can um, really dry out in, in the late uh, months of the summer. That's where oak becomes most competitive. So in Washington, uh, this tends, or Western Washington at least, because um, there's lots of oak in like the gorge and parts of the Eastern, but in, in our neck of the woods, this is gonna be sort of the North Willamette Valley, Clark County area, South Puget Sound has some oaks as well. And up in the San Juans, these are areas that are drier or have drier soils. Um, and that's where oak can outcompete some of our other native species. So this is the broad range. Um, you can see it grows even up into Vancouver Island there, but um, you know, it's, you're not going to find it just anywhere, especially just anywhere here in Washington. Um, really, this is a better map, at least of the South Puget Sound region. This is from a study in 1920 on oak habitat. And you can see all the green is where you have oak dominated woodlands. Um, I'm just looking at the chat box. Sorry, I totally forgot about Oak Har Harbor on Whidbey Island. That's, that's, of course, another area where oak can dominate. And I'm sure I'm missing some others as well. Um, but here you can see where some of the oak uh, really dominates in South Puget Sound. Lots on the JBLM land. That's what this sort of palish color is here. It's all JBLM. And they're really doing some interesting stuff to actually restore oak there. And if you're in Southwest Washington, you probably know this area. This is the Scatter Creek with lots of oak woodlands in there. Um, so, it, you know, where it where it exists, it can be dominant specifically because of those droughtier soils or maybe being a little bit of a range so oak up in uh squim i've seen as well um so special conditions allow for oak to really become dominant so looking at the silvical characteristics um it is also monaceous as of all the trees been we've discussed so far meaning separate male and female flowers but all housed on the same tree so the flowers, as we mentioned, late spring through to early summer, and then the acorns ripen in late summer into maybe November, uh, eventually falling and then germinating in the fall, possibly late fall or spring. As soon as these things germinate, they're, they're rapidly developing tap roots. That's why they're so good at establishing in difficult soils because they invest in that root system, particularly in that tap root. It's also the reason that it's very difficult to transplant after that tap root's been established. 
So the shoots or, or the small seedlings can really remain small and stubby for several years before they get taller and reach that sapling stage, again, because they're investing in that root system. Uh, oaks, really like pretty much all hardwoods, really are, are capable of reproducing vegetatively. Um, and oaks are particularly good at doing this post fire disturbance. Um, not necessarily as vigorous as the stump sprouter as say big leaf maple, which we talked about yesterday, but certainly can reproduce vegetatively. Uh, it's, as we mentioned or alluded to, it's a very niche species. It grows in places that most other species simply can't. So it's a really good solution for so those like troublesome sites where you can't seem to get any of our other native species growing. It is considered shade intolerant, meaning it would require large gaps or possibly a clear cut in order to really regenerate or wide open space, lots of light in order to grow uh, and establish. That said, there was a couple studies I found that actually showed that it it's able to, to get started at least under a light shade, uh, light to moderate. So it may not recruit into the overstory in that shade, uh, but may be able to handle a smaller gap than we think. So as we said, very slow growth, often less than a foot per year. And again, in Western Washington, we're very used to, to faster growth than that. We have really good tree growing ground. Um, and it can be as much as 15 to 20 rings per inch, which is quite dense. I mean, that that's just a, a number I was able to pull from some of the research. It's not necessarily standard, but certainly saying something to how slow these trees can grow. Growth can be better on good soils, of course, with management and then even with vegetative sprouting, it's taking advantage of that existing root system. Of course, all of those factors can increase uh, the growth rates. So oaks often develop into oak woodlands, um, but they can also be sort of more widely spaced like what you see here. And this was probably more the result of maybe agricultural development, leaving some trees behind. But historically, you could see a, a true dense oak woodland like this with a closed canopy or more of an oak savanna kind of habitat where you have trees, uh, you know, 100 plus feet apart. So and, and that is, of course, as we mentioned earlier, going to affect the form of the tree uh, because of its uh, widespread uh, root system. It's really good uh, wide, wide rooting patterns and that deep tap root as well, I'm sure, uh, as well as it's um, it's just it's just a very sturdy tree. So it's very resistant to ice, snow and wind throw damage, uh, which is always good this time of year. So in terms of damage and disease agents, there's a number of different things that can affect oak. Um, none of them particularly aggressive and worrisome, at least not, not like what we talked about yesterday with uh, some of the issues big leaf maple is facing. Um, so filbert worm and weevils often affect the acorns on really bad years. I've noticed it can be, or maybe in bad sites, um, more accurately, it can be very difficult to find an acorn that doesn't have these little holes. And, and once the weevil gets in there, it's really not a viable seed anymore. So if you're looking to collect these and for whatever reason, maybe to, to grow some seedlings, then be sure to check for these little weevil holes. Um, Western oak looper and forest tent caterpillar are both insect uh, defoliators. Western oak loop, looper, probably the worst of the two. Um, but keep in mind what we talked about previously, uh, hardwoods are, are relatively resistant to defoliation. They can actually, even if they're entirely defoliated, they can actually flush out a new set of leaves in a single season. And as long as they're not having to do that, you know, year after year after year, they'll recover just fine. And many of these defoliators follow that sort of boom and bust cycle where they have big populations and then they break and you don't hear from them for a while. So often not a long-term health concern for the tree. Our malaria root rot, um, oak is sensitive to, and of course, root rots are definitely capable of, of killing uh, trees, but relatively slow spreading and cannot sometimes be a more of a secondary pest uh, affecting more stressed trees. Some butt and heart rots, of course, are um, uh, problems with, with oak trees. There's an anthracnose that sort of behaves, not necessarily like a defoliator, but it affects the foliage. That's what you see here, often coming in sort of the later part of the season. And again, not really affecting long-term tree health. Uh, 
Uh, sudden oak death is the thing that we are looking for and on the watch for in Washington. I believe it's actually been found a handful of times, but isolated. Um, I could be wrong on that, but regardless, it's it's not present in our natural forests yet. And there was some evidence um, reading up on this that the the Oregon white oak may not be very susceptible to the sudden oak death, uh, although we certainly don't want to push our luck. Um, and then there's also a mistletoe that affects Oregon oak, which I wasn't aware of this. And for those of you that don't know, a mistletoe is actually a parasitic plant that infects trees. And I've never seen this in Washington. Uh, it's not to say it doesn't exist. It maybe is more present in Oregon where, where oak's a little more common. Ecological role and importance. So we mentioned it can be part of, um, you know, it can be its own dominant you know, oak woodland, but it can also be a part of mixed stands. I've certainly seen that um, where, you know, those excessively droughty sites is where oak is probably going to be more dominant just because it has that competitive edge. Um, but some other associated species listed here, one of the things that we're dealing with nowadays in oak woodlands, um, aside from um, loss to development um, or agriculture is encroachment from shade tolerant conifers, which is what you see here, where because of the exclusion of fire, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, some of these shade tolerant conifers are actually able to establish and then ultimately will will succeed the oak and become the dominant species there. Um, and then we we lose out on these oak woodlands. So conifer encroachment in this day and age is really a problem again because we have so little oak habitat left. Uh, we'll talk about the, how fire plays into that a little bit later. But again, a lot of the historical Oregon oak woodland and prairie sort of oak woodland prairie ecosystems in, in Oregon and Washington have been lost to development agriculture and fire exclusion. Uh, and uh, this is just, just another picture to show that camas can actually be an associate in some of these systems, which is uh, just, I like this picture a lot. It's really cool uh, to see that kind of crossover. Uh, importance to wildlife. So oak, this is one of the reasons that it's just such a, a high priority for uh, restoration is it's very critical to wildlife. Um, a lot of that due to the very nutritious acorn that it produces. So more than 200 vertebrate species utilize oak woodlands in Washington. Um, the diversity of bird species in oak woodlands is generally greater than that um, in conifer forests. It's important habitat for both western gray squirrel and pocket gopher, which are both threatened species or, or uh, species of concern. Uh, deer, bear, and small mammals eat the acorns, as do lots of different birds, uh, including turkeys, even though they're not really native to Western Washington. And of course, the foliage is fair browse for deer and elk, maybe not the preferable, but what really is um, interesting is that the, it, the oak woodlands provide good grazing space for some of these larger mammals. All right, so I wanted to talk about fire. Really, um, it, this is this is interesting, uh, at least for me as a, a forestry nerd, and I'm sure you guys wouldn't be signing up for this class if you weren't forestry nerds in some way. Um, but this is one of the very, really the only frequent fire ecosystems I can think of in Western Washington. Um, most of Western Washington is what we would consider an infrequent fire system with where fire really taking a long time or if, you know hundreds of years uh, or at least, you know, 100 years to return to the same area twice. Uh, whereas, you know, these oak woodlands really are more anal analogous to some of the frequent fire systems that you would see in, in eastern um, Washington, like a, similar to like a ponderosa pine forest, where uh, you would have frequent low severity surface fires that kill some of the shade tolerance in the understory, um, slick off some of those surface fuels and maintain an overstory of fire tolerant species. Well, that's what oak is. Oak has a very thick, hardy bark that protects them from that low severity fire. Of course, we mentioned can also vegetatively sprout. So if it is killed by a fire, it can reestablish very quickly. So um, frequent fire really maintains oak woodlands as the dominant or oak as the dominant species in these uh, ecosystems. And historically, they were maintained by indigenous peoples because it 
creates better hunting ground. And there was also some understory management for food and medicinal species. Um, of course, as we mentioned with development, settlement, and uh, in the present day, we've excluded fire uh, from these ecosystems. And in doing so, we allow for conifer encroachment. Um, and of course, not to mention just a lot of these lands were really ripe for development, some of the better lands for agriculture too. So they we we've lost so much of the the oak woodlands. So there's a lot of efforts to restore native oak and prairie ecosystems, as I mentioned, um, including reintroducing prescribed fire, uh, which again is very unique in Western Washington. This is one of the few examples where uh, frequent fire and prescribed fire uh, really makes sense uh, on this side of the mountains. So uh, could Oregon oak be a climate resilient species? I just want to touch on this quickly. This is just a few studies that touch on just the drought tolerance of, of Oregon oak. Oops, sorry. And the, the questions of, you know, whether or not maybe, maybe Oregon oak is going to become a more viable species for planting or habitat could potentially expand uh, as we have hotter, drier summers. As we said, Oregon oak is very competitive in those conditions. And when we think about some of our native species and how they're behaving with the hotter, drier summers, where you see their habitat kind of tightening and it's not, they're not really able to grow on some of the margins. You know, maple can't necessarily grow that well on some of the drier sites that are a little drier than it likes. It's they're kind of receding a little bit. Well, oak may be able to kind of expand in some of those areas. It's a, it's a generalization for sure. Um, and uh, a lot of what we're, we're basing these down is is models and, and research like this. Um, but I I would wager to bet that that Oregon oak um, could be a more viable species for planting in the decades to come, uh, including right now, uh, frankly. And that's good news because we need more more Oregon oak uh, anyway. And I personally really love Oregon oak, so I'd love to see more of it. In terms of indigenous uses of the, of the oak, um, it was a really important tree. I mean, as we mentioned, they they managed oaks through oak woodlands through fire, and they wouldn't just do that for no reason. Um, we talked about the better sort of hunting grounds, but also managing for acorns. Uh, acorns were a really important source of protein. Uh, if anybody's ever eaten an acorn raw, you know that it's uh, really quite bitter, and if you eat enough of them you can uh, actually get kind of sick because of the the tannins that are in them. But what they would do is actually leach the tannins out and then they could roast them, eat them raw, grind them into a flour. So they were a really important source, source of protein. Um, the, a lot of these pictures that I have here on the right are actually from tribes in California uh, where they relied on some of the more Southern oak species, but the process is uh, very similar. So the, the bark was also used to treat tuberculosis and other ailments. And of course, uh, the wood was used for structures and possibly fuel wood as well. But really, it was the acorns was the big contribution. Today, um, you know, white oak, organ oak is, is not typically harvested for commercial value in Washington. Uh, for all the reasons we've discussed, low populations, high priority for uh, conservation. Um, but there are certainly some products you can derive from the wood. Um, the wood, like all oaks, is hard and tough. That doesn't mean it's not usable, though. One of the unique features of oak is this tylosis, which I won't get into the details, but basically it means that in parts of the xylem, which composes the sap wood, there is these little outgrowths that make it really watertight. So it's good for holding fluids, and that's why they use it for barrels. It's also very bendable after steaming, which is great for barrels as well, and it's decay resistant. So other products would include furniture, flooring, possibly veneer, uh, though it could be hard to get a nice uh, peeler log out of some of the oaks, especially with those widespreading crowns. But crates and pallets and pulp too are also options. But again, it's not typically harvested uh, um, very often in, in Washington. There are some agroforestry opportunities with this. I'm going to just kind of breeze through this to keep on time. Um, but or grazing under oak is relatively common in uh, down in Oregon, again, because that light shade produces a lot of opportunity for forage growth. 
uh, acorn production for finishing livestock like pigs. Uh, you certainly have to be careful. You don't want to compact the soil. And so I, I, anyone that's interested in this, I do recommend uh, digging a little deeper into silvopasture and uh, rotational grazing and what that can do to mitigate uh, damage to the trees. So in terms of management, again, not commonly planted for commercial timber. I don't know of any commercial oak plantations, um, but it is certainly planted for its restoration value. Um, we talked about site selections, it re again, being most competitive on those droughty soils um, and being a very good tree for problem sites when you can't seem to get anything else to grow. Um, so in terms of site preparation, you know, as with anything, you want to control the, the surrounding vegetation, but with oak, it's, it can be particularly important or, or a good way to improve uh, growth, especially controlling grasses. Um, oftentimes, you would be planting into to grasses and oak systems. So it because it takes such a long time to, to free to grow, you want to do anything you can to increase that. That's less time that you have to spend uh, protecting it from competing vegetation and browse. So anything you can do to increase um, that. Uh, growth rate, that early growth rate is worthwhile. And, and one study here found that mulch and tree production uh, did significantly increase seedling growth. So seedlings can be a little bit difficult to come by, but they are also relatively easy to start yourself by going out and collecting acorns um, and, you know, starting them in pots. So again, uh, management, thinning and harvesting, uh, um, just want to reiterate that it's really generally not recommended to to harvest intensively at least oak for uh, wood products in Washington. That doesn't mean there's not opportunities though, uh, viable opportunities for, for harvest. And one of those would, would I imagine would be uh, commercial thinning. Uh, so oak is very sensitive to competition. Uh, so that's why it requires lower density stands in general. So this is a closed canopy stand here, you can see. But if you really look at the understory and look at the density of those trees, um, it's really not very dense, especially compared to like a conifer plantation. This is just guessing based off of looking as a whole, probably less than a hundred and less than 200 trees per acre for sure, maybe less than 150. And frankly, this could probably use a little bit of thinning. So this would be a scenario where you might actually go in and thin and get a little bit of commercial timber out of it. Again, when we're thinning, the whole idea is about supporting the trees that you're leaving behind and maintaining vigor in those trees. So you're selecting the poor performing trees, leaving the best and brightest behind. And then ongoing management for understory encroachment will probably be necessary, especially on those dry sites uh, where those conifers um, take on some shade tolerant behavior and can encroach on these oak woodlands. So yes, uh, potential for prescribed burns. I don't know of any private landowners doing prescribed burns in their oak woodlands. That's not to say they aren't. Um, and, I, and I couldn't really speak to the Pro probable bureaucratic hurdles and, and all of that to get that done. I don't want to deter anyone from looking into it by any means, because I think prescribed fire can be very ecologically uh, valuable in these settings. Um, but I know they are doing it on some lands like JBLM and I think down in Scatter Creek too. So definitely a possibility. There is also the option of sort of simulating that prescribed burns through mechanical management of conifers, basically going out and removing conifers before uh, they they get into that encroachment point where they're succeeding the oaks. Um, and I think that's just about it. I actually finished on time today. All right, so I'm going to look at the questions here. I saw the chat box moving around a bit. Uh, scroll to the top. So yes, I did forget about Oak Harbor. My apologies, Lauren. Uh, and apologies to anything else I might have missed there. Um, oh, Nick. Hey, Nick. Nick mentioned some some oak and squim as well. Um, let's see. Looking to see for some questions. So Devin mentioned that oak mistletoe is extremely common in Southwest Oregon. That's good to know. I wonder if anybody has seen it in Washington, though. Ken mentioned that bird species is abund abundance is also tied to insect abundance. Thanks, Ken. So the higher bird species uh, diversity and abundance in oak woodlands can then be related to higher insect abundance. Let's see. 
Regarding wild, Alex says regarding wildlife, oak is the number one tree species for caterpillar, moth and butterfly species, critical for birds during nesting season as a primary source for food and chicks. Um, this, that's great. So every, people are really adding a lot of good information. Uh, and that's, that's awesome. Uh, you all maybe know more about oaks than I do. So Marcy asked, the farmland trust I belong to has a nice grove of oak. Is there funding available to help clear the invasive species under the trees? That's really interesting. I don't, nothing comes to mind to clear invasive species underneath trees. Um, the NRCS, for instance, has a program called EQIP, Environmental Quality Incentive Program. And they provide funding to remove invasive species that are competing with young trees, um, like in an early growth, like plantation. But if it's underneath trees, an established canopy, that's a little tougher to find funding for. I'm not sure where you are, but you might try reaching out to your local conservation district. Um, and also, too, I know the DNR is currently working on a cost share program paying for forest health activities, and I, but I cannot speak at all. Um, and maybe it's someone from the, maybe Ken, maybe you know, um, to whether or not they would pay for that particular activity. So I don't have a, a great answer. Um, so someone did mention USD NRCS. Again, may, maybe worth reaching out to them, but my understanding is that when it's not a affecting the establishment of a forest canopy that they may not pay for it. Um, Lisa asked, do you know if it was used by natives for canoes? Uh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Yeah, because it's watertight and bendable. Um, I did not find any evidence of that. And the website I was on, I forget the name of it. I'll make sure I provide that in the additional resources. Uh, was pretty exhaustive list of all the things that they had evidence of. And I never saw anything about canoes, but I may have missed that. So I'll send that website out and maybe you can do a little more digging on that, Lisa. Um, let's see, Mark asked, because it is dependent on reducing understory competition, fire preferred mixed succession species, is there a way to reduce competition without intentional fires? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I mean, so like commercial thinning of the overstory of an oak woodland is totally possible just in terms of, oh, oh, sorry, reducing understory competition. Um, yeah, you, you certainly can analog a fire to some degree, it may not have all the same ecological benefits of a, of a true fire, but but analoging it just by simply going out and mechanically removing those conifers is certainly going to go a long way to maintain the dominance of uh, an oak overstory. And Ken provided a really good article on Oregon white oak. There are several actually, and I'm going to make sure that I do. Um, oh, Ken, are you? If you're still here, there are people hanging on, and I can try to find you in the participant box to let you speak. I have to give you special permission. If you're still around, hold on just a sec. There you are. Ken, I'm allowing you to talk. Hi, Patrick. Hey, Ken, how are you? For those of you that don't know, Ken Bevis is the wildlife biologist for the uh, DNR service forestry program. Yeah, and I get excited about oaks too, Patrick. I've uh, <laughs> spent some time in Eastern Washington and I helped prepare this article that I just linked here in the Woodland Fish and Wildlife series. And we tried to do an overview of many of the things you're talking about. And in particular, a link at the back of that Woodland article where that link is, there's a BL, I think it was BLM made a guide about oak restoration aimed at the Willamette Valley, but it's so good. So you'll find this BLM online publication. It's almost like everything you wanted to know about oaks and trying to grow them. Uh, is in there. It's pretty remarkable. And so Patrick, that was an excellent overview. And I wanted to encourage people to go to that Woodland article because it addresses many things, including regeneration using acorns rather than uh, trying for uh, uh, seedlings. So thanks, Ken. It, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for letting me uh, point that out. Oh, okay. and Wait, the second one was I put a link in there to, I just watched this. It was a 
presentation to the Columbia Land Trust by a professor from Delaware who's an oak expert. Patrick, you should watch this. Uh, his name is Talami. He just did it. They recorded it. Uh, the link is public. And this guy did a great job of talking about oaks in general, including Oregon white oaks and their ecological roles and all these cool ins and outs, including the role of insects in particular. And this guy was an entomologist. So I highly recommend that that first link. And you might pop that in your, your after, after message. So yeah, thanks, Patrick. And nice job on these seminars. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, really appreciate that. Um, and it looks like too, the, the subsequent question was very similar. Can you speak to what growing these from seed might look like and special considerations for doing so? So uh, Isaiah, I really point you to that publication, um, just a couple comments above your question. Um, and because I, you know, I, I've only germinated really oak seedlings myself. I haven't been able to successfully establish them outside. Yeah, so I have limited experience in doing this uh, on my own. Um, suffice to say, I, I, I do think there's a lot of potential for starting your own seedlings and going that direction. Uh, Leslie says, check out the Bayshore Preserve in Shelton for some beautiful large oaks as well as their oak restoration efforts. Yeah, Shelton's another place where you can hit, there was historically quite a bit of, of both prairie and sort of oak woodland habitat. All right, working our way through here. Uh, Craig asks, oak is, a, oak is re often recommended in permaculture. Does it make sense to add this in areas where it hasn't traditionally been common? Cascade foothills. Uh, you know, in the context of a permaculture uh, setting, I, I mean, I would say absolutely. Um, you know, I, it's, it's, that's a very manicured setting. And as long as you're competing, or sorry, controlling competing vegetation and, and giving that oak uh, all the chances it needs to become, a, a, you know, an actual tree actually grow and, and survive, then I think it would be totally fine. Um, I don't think you need to worry necessarily about site conditions unless, um, I don't know, unless it's like a, a truly, truly very excessively wet area. It's the only situation where I think oak might not be able to um, survive, but probably wouldn't be doing permaculture there anyway. I, I really think oak probably can survive on, on most sites. It's just the fact that in a natural setting, it's not competitive on those sites with some of our native species that grow there so much better, if that makes sense. Marcy asked, are the weevil invaded acorns any good for harvesting, for eating or planting, or are they so damaged that they're not good for anything? They, they won't be good for planting. Once the weevil's in there, um, in there they, they won't germinate. Um, eating I, I can't say i can't speak to that probably not <laughs> i would say probably not and uh even if they were you'd be eating bugs but maybe you're okay with that um so i i would guess no but i've never really tried to to actually uh eat any of the acorns that have weevils in them uh yeah so someone else mentioned the book the nature of oaks by talame that is actually sitting on my bedside table right now and i haven't cracked it yet uh and i've been really meaning to lately so alan asks i see a healthy band of oak at a rest area in the gorge maybe 20 miles east of hood river Root hood river about the time you leave high rainfall area are you familiar with this area and are they gary oaks likely there's a lot of uh of oregon oak in the gorge uh they do really well in that area oh sorry no i'm thinking of <laughs> i'm thinking of a different area hood rivers sorry uh no i'm not familiar with uh that particular band of oak All right, let's see. Here's the, the web address for DNR for the thank you, Gary, for submitting the landowner assistance portal. That's a really great resource. Uh, man, there's so many comments today. Um, I don't want to hold anyone too long. If you have to hop off, I, remember this will be recorded. We searched all over for acorns this year. All trees seem to be devoid from about August to November. What would cause that? Um, well, you know, that's an interesting question. You know, trees have heavy mast years. That's a, a kind of a strategy to just basically put out so much seed that um, 
uh, that all the wildlife and, and whatnot can't get to it. And then some of them are actually able to establish, establish. So that's the idea of a heavy mast year where there's just a ton of acorns. And then in between those heavy mast years, you might have years where it's uh, really, really low. Um, you know, there's not a lot of oaks or, or of acorns. I think it's quite rare to find a year where there's no acorns though. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on with that. Um, but my best guess is you're sort of in between maybe mast years. As asked if you would talk more about oak galls, I would love to talk more about oak galls, but I know very little about them. Uh, so I apologize for that. Tara asked, is poison oak an associative species? Yes, it is. Uh, poison oak really likes those uh, dry sites, those really droughty sites. Um, so, it, so it might not be, it might not accompany oak where it's taking over sort of a, a clay uh, soil, but in those um, more um, gravelly, dry, excessively droughty soils, you might find some oak there. And I know that because I'm horribly allergic to poison oak. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, I'm always aware of, of where it's going to be. I feel like I can spot it from a mile away. So a few more comments here. Well, should go, oh, so it looks like back to that original comment, uh, from Ken says, yes, those are Oregon white oak by hood river. So that's great. All right. Most years are cyclic. Telemay talks a lot about galls. Oh, it's a great topic. Thanks, Ken. All right, cool. I think that's the end of it. Um, wait, nope. There's actually a couple questions in the Q&A box, which I always forget. Um, looks like I answered that one. Okay, so... Douglas Tallamy recommends oak over other species for insect habitat supporting native food web. Is oak better than other PNW species for native food web support? Um, gosh, that's a tough question. And, you know, it's hard to say. Certainly what we've pointed out today, that oak is extremely valuable wildlife species, and that includes insects, according to, to Ken's comment, particularly about um you know, higher bird populations are tied to higher insect populations, and certainly in oaks, oak woodlands, that's true. So, so certainly it has very high value, um, maybe higher than most, but it occupies a niche just like any other species. And we yesterday we talked about how you know um, big leaf maple can contribute to higher invertebrate content uh, or invertebrate populations in riparian zones. So everything has its niche. I have a really hard time saying one is better than the other, but yes, certainly oak is a bit of a superstar when it comes to native food web support. Uh, Jim Sidora asks, are you aware of any cultivars of Gariana that would grow smaller or more columnar and could be used in more urban communities. I am not, and I'm really, frankly, not aware of any cultivars of Quercus gariana. Um, and really, what would force it to grow more columnar, as you said, you know, more height growth, would be that com competition from either side. Which, again, yeah, of course, very difficult in an urban setting to do that. Instead, it, it's really gonna want, and, and most dark oaks are this way too, although there are certainly more, there are certainly more cultivars of other ornamental oaks, you know, like your, your red oak families and stuff like that, that you might be able to find, but but the actual native Quercus gariana is always, in an open setting, it's always gonna wanna grow out and wide, and from that standpoint, probably into the windows of your house. Um, so, okay. So I, I hope I answered everyone's questions. Um, of course you have my email here if you have any others, or if you have additional, uh, resources that you would like me to share with the group, you are more than welcome to, to send those as well. I've kept track of a couple that we've talked about today and I'll make sure that we're really accruing a, a quite a long list for that, uh, that email next week so that's good i hope you guys will hang on to that other than that though i will call it quits here and we will meet again tomorrow for the final installment and talk about organ ash all right thanks everybody